Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for your word. Lord, we're forever grateful for the word of God that you have instructed us as a light that shines in darkness. You've given hope to our heart. You've given us a more sure way to have confidence in a fallen world. Lord, now I ask you by your word to strengthen our soul. Make it bold as a lion before you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This is session 17. It's talking about David being tested with the power of revenge. One of the uh, most powerful tests that God ever gives a believer, and He only gives that test a couple times in a lifetime. Though I believe everybody, as a rule, has an opportunity to be in a position where they can release and manifest the revenge that's in their heart to some degree. They get at least... Little measures of this. This is a very graphic display of this opportunity in David's life on two occasions. Chapter 24, which we will cover tonight, and then chapter 26. We'll skip 25 and go right to 26. Two times in a row at this very critical time, David has a divine appointment. But the divine appointment is very different than any other divine appointment he had. Because in these two appointments... He was in the position to do evil and to get away with it in the arena of man. And yet, what he would do with these two opportunities would manifest and reveal where his source was in a way different than all the other types of testings. David, again, has the unique experience. He has the unique position in the Word of God. He has more danger, more divine interventions literally than anybody in Scripture, besides the Lord Jesus Himself in terms of divine interventions. He has more dangerous situations. They are so diverse. He has every manner of testing, every conceivable mood from the depths of depression to the heights of utter ecstasy and joy in the presence of the Lord. And the Lord has given David to us as an example of a weak man in every single possible opportunity of life. This is one of the stranger ones. Again, I believe that every one of us is a rule. There are, I'm sure, uh, there are exceptions. Everyone doesn't. But most of us, on one or two occasions in our life, we are divinely orchestrated, through divinely orchestrated events. The Lord brings us to a position where we have the power to act out vengeance or revenge. But the problem is, so often we do not know it's a divine appointment and it's a test determining our future. We think of it as... Finally, payday has come, and the Lord says, no, it's still seminary. This is, this is yet one more test. And it's very essential that we operate in these tests in a way that are pleasing to the Lord. Let's jump right into it. 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1. Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, take note, David is in the wilderness of Engedi." Now, David had just been following the Philistines because you remember chapter 23, our last session. David was trapped and surrounded by Saul. He had been betrayed at Keilah and betrayed at the wilderness of Ziph by the inhabitants of of those two areas. Saul now has 3,000 soldiers surrounding David. The Philistines break out in war against Israel and Saul has to retreat. Uh, in order to protect some of the, the uh, territory that was obviously dear to him, because obviously Saul didn't always care when the Philistines attacked, but in this occasion he did. So he had to back away, he had to let David go free. Chapter 24, it's exactly opposite of chapter 23. Chapter 23, Saul is surrounding David. Chapter 24, David is surrounding Saul. In a moment's time, in a very, very short span of time, The tables have turned 180 degrees. I've been around the kingdom enough to see that happen on a number of occasions. I've had the opportunity to watch tremendous arenas of conflict. And even sometimes in a short period of time, it's exactly the opposite. And the person in the quote, the position of power is in the exact opposite than it was previously. The Lord has those sudden turns of events. But then and again, it's important, then again, it's important to understand these are divine tests. It was never the will of God that David would act these things out as though he had the authority, but rather he.
was to, under this particular opportunity, submit himself to the Lord. It was a unique temptation. Rather than a, an abundance of money or abundance of, of honor and favor, he was in a, in a position of an abundance of power to remove his adversaries. It's a temptation of a different, a different flavor. So David is now in the wilderness of Engedi. Verse 2, Saul took 3,000 choice men from all of Israel. This was the standard group, uh, the uh, specially assigned assassins that had one object. They could be uh, uh, relieved from the duties of war. They had one specific mandate to kill David. David now had 600 men that had gathered to him, so it's 3,000 verse 600. But David's men were not really loyal at this point in time, so it could have been 3,000 to 1 at any given time. Verse 2, And Saul took 3,000 chosen men from Israel and went to seek David. Verse 3, He came to the sheepfolds by the road, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his needs. Saul actually went and slept in that cave when it was all said and done. And David was hiding in the cave, in the caves of Engedi. Well, all in southern Israel, some of the caves are very vast, and hundreds of, of people could be resident in those caves. So David's back deep into the cave. It wasn't at the entrance. And Saul comes and, and he ends up sleeping in that very cave that David is hiding in. I mean, what is the chances of that? The one place that Saul was sure was safe. Through all the reports of his scouts, he ascertained the whole situation. This is the one safe place. See, when the Lord is ruling and reigning and orchestrating events, you never know What's going to happen? Of course, again, this is a divine appointment for David, not really for Saul. It is for Saul because it gives Saul an opportunity to repent. But it's really a divine appointment for David. Not an opportunity to take revenge, but a divine appointment, a time of testing. Then the men of David, verse 4, said to him, This is the day of which the Lord has said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose secretly and cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Now, there's several different views of this verse. That there had been a prophetic word circulating around the, uh, at least David's camp. That there would come a time of which the Lord would deliver David's enemy into his hand and David could do with him what he wanted. Now, it's very possible that was a true prophetic word. But these men and their carnality misinterpreted the word to mean it was okay for David to do evil. When the prophetic word might have been a real word, I mean, certainly the rumor was circulating as to whether it was an authentic word from the Lord. My guess is it was. But the word had a different intention than they were interpreting it. They were saying, now your enemy is before you. Do what you want. This is the opportunity to do evil and to be blessed in it and to call evil good. And David interprets it as, yes, it is the true word of the Lord. He is standing before me in order that I might be tested by His presence before me, that I might be, it might be revealed who is my source. Because in most occasions, men would look to Saul as their source. To gain Saul's favor is to enter into the purpose of God, or to remove Saul would be to enter into the purpose of God. And David saw neither one. He didn't need Saul's favor, nor did he need to remove Saul to enter into the purpose of God. For God alone would put David in David's purpose in God. And this is a very, very important test because it's so, it's so desperately easy for us to begin to take the promise of God and to view human beings as the primary source. Now, the Lord will use human beings in a secondary way, but the problem comes when we begin to have confidence in the human agency that God uses as part of the circumstance and the provision, but that human agency is never meant to be viewed as the primary source. The group that's going to give money and power and honor is never the real issue in God's economy. They're always a secondary issue. And again, the Lord lets David stand right before Saul, and the Lord says to David's heart, David... Is Saul your source? Because if Saul is your source, you better take care of him now. If I am your source, you don't have to put your hand upon him. Now David's men interpreted that prophetic word very differently than David. They said, wait a second, this guy's an evil man. He's demonized. 
He slaughtered a whole city of priests. He's a murderer. He's destroying the nation of Israel. There were many, many good rationale in order to get rid of Saul. But there's only one problem. Saul was the anointed of the Lord until the Lord removed him. And David would argue and reason with them. He says, you guys don't understand. This isn't just a bad guy causing me trouble. This is the king in this uniquely anointed office by God himself. I can't touch the anointing of the Lord. But rather I give that into God's hands to touch. It would be different if he didn't represent God's authority. But he does represent God's authority. And by the way, God's authorities are represented in many levels of society. The government represents God's authority. There's different ways to make godly appeals to the government. Romans 13 tells us that they, they are delegated authorities from heaven. Sometimes I just I, I look at the way that our nation and the body of Christ uh, responds to the king, quote, of this nation, the president. We don't want to touch the president in an evil way. We want to make godly appeals. We want to use the rightful means of, of uh, legislation, etc., etc., but we don't want to transgress because it's the common way of, of this nation to do that. We don't want to violate spiritual authority. There's spiritual authority in the home. There's spiritual authority in the job. There's spiritual authority in the church and spiritual authority in the, uh, the uh, government. Four arenas of spiritual authority. Now, they're all limited authority, but they do have marks of God's authority because spiritual authority is delegated authority that belongs to God. And what we do is, again, we make appeals and we don't let those spiritual authority have, have an authority beyond what God has ordained. But at the same time, we honor spiritual authority. It was one of the great hallmarks of David's maturity. David didn't see Saul. David saw the hand of God, the authority of God on Saul. It wasn't Saul that David was afraid of. It was the authority of heaven that David trembled before. He looked at Saul and says, I have no problem with you. I can... I, you're no match for me, Saul. You're a cowardly man. But the problem is it's the office that you stand in. I must let God take care of you. Again, I've seen people have an inappropriate respect for spiritual authority, and they give too much ground to spiritual authority, and then all kinds of abuses take place, etc., etc. But there are biblical grounds for honoring authority, and that's what's going on. David, in verse 4 at the end, rose secretly and cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterwards that David's heart was troubled because he had cut Saul's robe. Now the reason David's troubled by that isn't because it has nothing to do with, David, with Saul's garment. You know, like, well, he ruined one of his shirts. That's not what he's talking about. But Saul's robe represented the kingly office. Saul's robe represented his divine authority. That's what David was touching. It was the robe, it was the royal garment that he put his hand against and touched it. Again, this is a very, very critical time in David's life. David doesn't know at this time he's being tested. That's how these tests work. Afterwards, he would understand. But in this particular moment, David is not exactly sure. The integrity of his heart is just is right there beaming within, within him or it's absent. That's the problem with tests. They come in such, there's, life is in such a pace and the momentum and the emotion is so intense it's difficult to disconnect and go, wait a second, this is just a test. But the reality of David's honor of God's authority was present at that hour. It was something that was deeply a part of him, of his, of a, deeply a part of his spiritual foundation. Okay, so the robe is a sign of Saul's office. It's a sign of God's authority upon David's life. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, God's authority in the nation of which David would honor. Verse 6, and he said to his men, to the 600 men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. And here's the point. He's the Lord's anointed. He's not just Saul. He's not just the king of a nation. He was anointed and put there deliberately by God. God forbid that I would touch the Lord's anointed in an illegal way. Now David could pray that righteousness would abound. David could pray that God would stop iniquity. And that's how David dealt with Saul. David kicked into spiritual warfare to stop Saul, but David never used his own position, his own power. He never used words. He never used finance. He never used his, quote, clout in order to stop Saul at any time. He could have on a number of occasions. But the issue is in verse 6. He was the Lord's anointed. He says, I can't stretch out my hand against him, my finances, my speech. 
I can't orchestrate. I can't because He is the Lord's anointed. He says it two times in verse 6. Again, it's a divine appointment testing David. So David restrained his servants with these words. I mean, there are 600 guys who are really tired of being out in the wilderness. And David says, no, you guys, having the position without the blessing of God, we will end up like Saul. We don't want the position, the inheritance without God's blessing. It says in the book of Proverbs that an, inherit, an inheritance gained speedily is not blessed in the end. An inheritance that is gained out of God's timing is not blessed in the end. Somebody that gains too much too quick before the Lord has prepared the larger context, that inheritance ends up creating so much pressures that typically it destroys the person that gains the inheritance, though it's the nature of every man and woman to get the inheritance as quick as we can. The Lord understands that, so the Lord restrains us in ways that we have no control. It's a very important principle, an inheritance gained in a hurry. The young person called to ministry wants to get the crowd so bad and have authority so desperately, they'll do anything to speed the process up, only to discover that even in God's time, the pressures are far different than they imagine. The pressures of spiritual authority, just as a little uh, side thing, that one of the number one problems in ministry, for those of you that are called into, quote, full-time ministry, besides the spiritual dynamics of warfare, etc., is the issue of criticism. There's nobody can stand in a position of public authority in the spirit or in the natural without bearing criticism, without having lots of it. And when I talk to people who are looking to increase the sphere of their ministry, I try to make it clear to them, I say, what you're talking about is in a very real way increasing the sphere of criticism or rejection and, and abuse against you. They go, well, well, I go, no, you don't really understand what I'm saying. You cannot increase in authority without increasing in personal attacks against you. And the Lord knows that. And He knows that that position, if you're not ready for it, it will be destructive. I've seen people go from having no public uh, uh, prominence at all to 50 or 100 people after a year to this. I'm so burnt out, I can't believe the amount of conflict. I said 500 is just 10 times as many. It really is. And 5,000 is 10 times as many as that. One of the things that I, I remember being really uh, jolted by in a, in, a, in, a, in a learning way was my time of traveling with John Wimber. I traveled with him for three years, and he had a platform that touched a million-plus people. And, and John would talk and very openly with a number of people, not just with me, about the amount of people who stood against him and friends that now despised him. And, and he, he would, he's had thousands of people in the body of Christ who who completely despised him. And he says, Mike, you'll never know the amount of pain that I walk in because of the authority that I have. And he says, I don't know any man in my sphere that doesn't have this amount of pain coming at them. He says, don't ever have a bigger sphere than God makes you have because you're only confused about it if you don't understand. It means more attack and the possibility of more pain. And he talked uh, quite at length about that on a number of occasions. And, and I went, wow. That's really true. Well, that's what the Lord's doing with David. We don't want our inheritance in the public domain quicker than God wants to give it to us. Because always with it comes, there's all kinds of attacks, but the one sure one is criticism from people that you care about. That will always take place. Matter of fact, it's typically proportionate to the size and uh, uh, of platform that you have publicly. And then there's the spiritual dimensions and all kinds of them, jealousy dimensions. and all, There's all kinds of dimensions when you stand in front of people. The pro, the, no question, the most hated man in the earth is, is the President of the United States because he stands in a position to give more favor. And so more human beings hate the most powerful man of the earth. The only person more hated than the President is God. God is the most hated person in the whole world. Because people imagine he could do more for them and they despise him. Authority always brings that kind of conflict. Verse 7, David restrained his servants. And I believe he restrained them with the wisdom, saying, Guys, we don't want a position of authority before God's timing. And we don't want a position of authority without the favor of God. Because if we get it without God putting us in it, 
then we have to direct it instead of the Lord prophetically directing it. We have to provide for it instead of the Lord uh, supernaturally providing, and we have to protect it. If you finagle, if you manipulate your way into a position, you have to protect it, you have to provide for it, and you have to give guidance for it. You've got to fight off the enemies because the Lord's not committed to fighting off the enemies to a position He never called you to. At the end, it's just totally a waste of time. I've seen guys put a tremendous amount of energy on a scale of 1 to 10 to get from 3 to a 4 to a 5, and they prop it up with every means possible, and a few months later, they're back down to 3. Water reaches its level. We only have the sphere we have in God. John the Baptist said it most clear. A person can only receive what they receive from heaven. And I believe that's the wisdom David has. He goes, then we don't want something because inherently in that position there's something good for us in that position. We want it because we've been called to it by God. And when God calls us and then God releases it, He protects us. He provides for us and He directs it. Could you imagine directing a ministry, providing for it financially and spiritually, and protecting it from enemies and God's not with you? Any position that we work ourselves into that is not called of God, we have to provide for, protect it, and direct it. That sounds like a major hassle to me. And then you have the criticism coming. What we want to find out is the God-ordained position and walk in it. We don't want to increase it or decrease it. We want to walk in it according to the season God's called us. And I believe that's part of the reasons, ways that, that God... David is restraining his men. He's giving him the wisdom that being king is not in itself the issue. Walking in the sphere of God is the issue. David restrained his servants. He did not allow them to rise up against Saul. Saul got up from the cave and went out on his way. He didn't even know what would happen. I, I, just, I just have a lot of feeling about verse 7. He restrained them. He had to talk them out of it. There must have been 10 or 15. David, the prophetic word, this is the hour. This guy's an evil man. He's leading the nation away from God. Kill him. David says God will kill him when, he's when it's time for Saul to die. And First Chronicles 11 says that God killed Saul. God killed Saul at the right time. Verse 8. David arose afterwards and went out of the cave and he called out to Saul saying, My Lord the King. I imagine Saul's down in the valley and David's up, you know, on the hill at a good distance, possibly a little creek in between. <laughs> My Lord the King. And Saul looked behind him and David stooped with his face to the ground. He bowed down. And this was genuine. He was honoring Saul's authority in the Lord. Not, not the person Saul. He didn't trust Saul's character, but he did honor the position Saul was in. And David said to Saul, why are you listening to the words of men who say, indeed, David seeks your harm? Now, see, this is part of David's problem. In Saul's court, there are jealous men that are slandering David. Saul already had a jealous spirit and lots of demons harassing him in depression, and he had his own problems with David, but complicating the issue because David went so quickly up the ladder of prominence that it caused a tremendous disruption in the social dynamics in Saul's court. So a number of men have been telling Saul very elaborate stories and scenarios that are reinforcing Saul's fear and jealousy of David. Saul has proof. Saul has documented evidence that David's a bad guy. I remember reading once the uh, uh, story of Joseph in Genesis chapter 40 to 50. Those ten chapters so or so are is the story of Joseph. And Joseph was the favorite. If you're the favorite of the one in authority, you are in trouble. Seriously, you are in trouble in social dynamics. There's no way you can be the favorite without being in big trouble with, with other people. Saul, uh, Joseph was the favorite. He got these dreams from the Lord that said, you know, I'm really going to do it. And it says, and David, and, I mean, it says, and uh, Joseph told his brothers, and I wrote, bad. <laughs> now you might ask, how do you know that's bad? <laughs> I've told a few things in my day that it was just, just stupid. Well, I wanted to kind of speed things up a little bit. The Lord says, you don't want to. I'm going as fast as I can without shipwrecking your life. I'm giving you the least amount of trouble and the most amount of blessing without disrupting the equilibrium of your life in a way that would destroy you. God is giving us, I truly believe this from the Scripture, He is giving you the least amount of trouble and the most amount of blessing without completely disorienting your life. 
And remember, God's looking, He knows the seeds in our heart that we can't discern. Of course, all of us think, again, that we're a little different than the average guy, and we would do better than them. If we won the lottery, we'd be noble about it. We wouldn't be like this other 85 in a row that messed their life up with it. We would be different if we won it. We all imagine that, but we have seeds in the garden, so to speak, that God sees crystal clear, and He says, no. There's dynamics 5, 10, and 15 years down the road you can't see. And I really care about, especially you. And I'm going to give you the least amount of trouble and the most amount of promotion I can give you without disrupting who you are in the next 40 and 50 years and then that which carries on into the age to come. Because see, the Lord's operating on a real big picture. And so David has these men and he's, he's uh, uh, pinpointing, verse 9, the slander that these jealous men in Saul's court, that again was the fruit of David's favor with Saul. Very, very difficult to have favor without disrupting things. That was Jesus' problem. The people liked him too much. It wasn't just that he preached righteousness and convicted the scribes and Pharisees. That was a problem for sure. But the real problem is the people liked him. The real problem with John the Baptist is the people liked him. And that creates tremendous social dynamics when the people like you. It doesn't matter if it's ten people in a friendship group and all of a sudden one of them the Lord puts his hand on in a special way. A couple of those other ten start getting fidgety and start coming up with little theories as to why you're not so hot. And it just doesn't matter what level it is. It just happens everywhere in life. It happens in the playground. It happens in the Oval Office. It happens in the corporate America. It happens at every level of life. And that's what's happening in David's life in verse 9. And David's well aware of it. He says, Saul, I didn't do all those things. Saul says, I have 15 verified stories. They heard you say it with their own Ears. David says, I didn't say it. I don't care, Saul. It's not true. Verse 10. Look, this day your own eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you into my hand in the cave. It's interesting. This is the same language. Because back in 1 Samuel 23, Saul goes, the Lord has delivered David. They, they, this must have been the key phrase of, uh, of, of the day, you know. The Lord, except for this time, David is interpreting it in an accurate way. He says, the Lord put you here. And the Lord did this. He orchestrated it. It wasn't an accident. He says, and someone even urged me to kill you. But I spared you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord. Why? Because you have the authority of God on you. You're the Lord's anointed. He says, I won't touch the authority of the Lord. The Lord will touch you. I won't touch you. I will pray. I will make my appeals to you, but I won't lift my voice against you. I won't use my power to stop you. He says, can't you see? I fear the Lord, Saul. Verse 11, he goes beyond honor now to affection. Moreover, my father, he calls him my father. Well, he is his father because he married Saul's daughter. It's his father-in-law. He bows before him as king, and now he calls him Father, an endearing term, he says, see the corner of, the, of your robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, no one see. There's not evil rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you. Yet you hunt my life to take it, he says, you're driven by these lies. Of course, David understood that the Lord himself was the one training David through this scenario. That was one of great, David's great abilities, was to see God in the midst of these kinds of things. Verse 12, one of the great statements of David. Let the Lord decide. Let the Lord judge between you and me. David says, I'm not going to judge you. I will never use my words or my deeds to stop you, but I will invoke God's supernatural intervention to stop you. He goes, that's the only weapon I will use on you is prayer. I will ask God to judge what is wrong. That's the only thing I'll do. And if you're wrong, then He will judge you. If you're not wrong, then don't worry about it. What a powerful resolve. The Lord judged between you and me. He says the same thing in verse 15. He says the same thing in chapter 26, verse 9 to 11. We'll look at it in a minute. It's just the same story nearly again in chapter 26. Verse 9 to 11. A number of times in David's life, one of his hallmark phrases, you find it in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. 2 Samuel 15, verse 25. Just give you a few of them. 2 Samuel 16. It's a whole story from verse 14 to 4 to 14. 
chapter 16, verse 14. There's a number of times where David backs away and he says, I'll let the Lord intervene. If the Lord didn't intervene, you're free. This drove David's men crazy. They said, how can you do this? He says, I'm telling you, the God of heaven is far more powerful than either you or I. So let the Lord judge between you and me and let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. He says, Saul, if you're innocent, don't worry. The Lord will give you mercy because the Lord won't judge you for mistakes. He will judge you for deliberate, persistent rebellion. Deliberate evil, not mistakes. So if you've made mistakes, the Lord will cover you like He's covered me. If we could learn to live in the reality, 1 Samuel 24, verse 12, right there. It's one of the great Davidic uh, uh, lifestyles, values that, that he always lived in. Throughout his life, this idea of invoking God's intervention when there was conflict and he himself not using his words or his power, financially, position, whatever. He goes on in verse 13, as the proverb of the ancient says, the wickedness proceeds from the wicked. He goes, if, if I'm a wicked man, I would have done wicked to you just then. I would have killed you up there. Nobody would have stopped me. Verse 14, now he kind of puts himself down. He goes, after whom has the king of Israel come out? He goes, here you are in this noble, dignified position. Whom do you pursue? I'm a dead dog. I'm a flea. He goes, I'm nothing. He goes, I am, I am no threat to you. I am no problem to you. I'm just a wandering dog or I'm a flea skipping around. I'm insignificant to a man of your stature and your dignity. He goes, and if you defeat me, well, you killed a dead dog. So what? He's already dead. He says, I'm already, I can't, I'm, I'm of no threat to you. I'm of, I have no power. I have nothing to threaten you with. He says, so if you defeat me, so what? 3,000 to 1. And he says his prayer again, therefore let the Lord be judge, or let the Lord decide, is one of what, how one of the other versions says it. Between you and me, let the Lord see. I like that. Let God plead my case. Let God deliver me. Let him decide or, or judge. Let him see, let him plead, let him deliver. That's how David entered into promotion and favor, and that's how he dealt with revenge in his enemies. He said, just let the Lord write it in His book and it will take place in the arena of man. I tell you, if, if, if to whatever degree that any of us connect into that principle, verse 12 and verse 15, our life begins to enter into a whole new peace. Because we don't see men and positions as the, as the source of favor or the source of trouble at the end of the day. At the end of the day, God's call is the source of favor and God training us is our source of trouble. The Lord is training us to operate in new realms of authority. And, and the Lord will train us as easy as possible so that He can give us the most authority that He can give us without hurting our lives. And every now and then, He'll let some guy kind of become an example for a nation. And He'll let them have their inheritance beyond where their character is. And, the whole, and then that person will, will enter, enter, enter into a big scandal. The whole nation will tremble then. They'll look at the man and go, oh my goodness. The Lord every now and then will allow someone to outrun what they've called the, what the Lord's... Uh, the character in His training, He gives them a, a, a release that's greater than what they are on the inside to cause others to, to uh, not lust after more in a wrong way. So when David had finished speaking these words to Saul... Saul said, is that your voice, my son David? And Saul's being sincere. Saul didn't have the capacity to be sincere and stay sincere, but he's sincere right here. I call that sweet rebellion. Where it, it kind of like Saul is really impacted at the emotional level. This is not fake. This is not political. He means it. He just didn't mean it very long. He didn't have the capacity to mean it in a way that matters. But he means it right here. I've been pastoring now just, just right at 22 years, and I've seen plenty of cases of sweet rebellion. Oh, yes! And they go, yeah, right! <laughs> I've seen that one before, and it's just trouble, 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 trouble. And that's what Saul's doing right here. Sweet rebellion. Oh, my son, my son! He wept. Men like Saul have the power to weep when their sins are discovered right in front of them. Weeping in itself isn't the, the end of the, isn't the measure. Then he said to David, you are more righteous than I. You have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. I mean, here's painstaking 
uh, honesty right here. Honesty and weeping. Wow, it's done now. No, it's not done. This guy has got a serious case of sweet rebellion. Well, no, no, you don't understand. He wept and he told in front of everybody that I did good and he did bad. It, hey, we're reconciled. Praise God, that's behind us. Verse 18, Saul continues, You have shown this day how you have dealt well with me, for the Lord delivered me into your hands. Now, Saul's operating in spiritual discernment. Totally opposite from chapter 23 when Saul said, God delivered David into my hands. Saul's completely reversed his position. Verse 19, he's praying blessing. May God reward you. Verse 20, he's prophesying. You shall surely be king. Verse 21, he makes a covenant with him. I mean, we're talking about tears. We're talking about the acknowledgement of evil. We're talking about blessing him. Calling him good and honest. We're talking about prophesying. You'll be king. We're talking about making a covenant, but it's all none of it's... It's all real in terms of Saul feeling the power of it, but none of it stays when pressure comes on. I remember the first couple of times I ran into this kind of thing. It kind of threw me for a loop. I thought that blessing, prophecy, open confession, covenant. I mean, hey, we got that one behind us. Well, no, it doesn't exactly work that way. Turn to chapter 26. I'm not trying to make you all cynics. But it is good to be wise. One of the great uh, realities in David's life we covered in the very first session, one of his qualities is that David knew what it meant to be wise as a serpent but innocent as a dove. In the uh, first number of years of my ministry, I was so focused on trying to walk in sincere motives. I wanted to be innocent like a dove. I didn't really put a lot of stock into being wise as a serpent. There's divine diplomacy that David operated in. It's not enough to just be innocent. You need to be wise if you're going to be in a position of public, uh, of public authority, regardless whether it's in the uh, secular arena or in the church world. If you're operating in divine authority in either one of those spheres, because there's divine authority in both, it's not enough to just be innocent. It's not enough to have good motives. Because good motives without wisdom will cause great trouble for you and the people that are under you. You need to be wise as a serpent. I think it's, un, it's just unusual to me that Jesus would take the serpent of all as, the, as what he would like in wisdom, craftiness like a serpent. He goes, I want you disciples, you holy apostles, to be like the serpent. Like the serpent? Well, Jesus, shouldn't you have said like wise as an owl or something? Aren't owls wise or something? No. Crafty. I want you having divine diplomacy. I want you understanding human dynamics is what he's saying. Don't be naive about human dynamics. That's all that Jesus, I believe, was saying. Don't be naive about human dynamics because in a position of leadership, you will cause great trouble for many people if you're naive about human dynamics. And again, I caused trouble for this church and even before here by stressing sincerity without understanding what you call it wisdom or you call it divine diplomacy or just... Call it sanctified cynicism, if you will. But it really is discernment is what it boils down to at the end of the day. It's the ability to see the human tendencies and when repentance is real and when it's not real. Chapter 26. Now the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David with us? Wait a second. This happened back in chapter 23, 19. Here these Ziphites are again. David's down in their area, and they send a delegation up to Gibeah, to the capital again, and say, Saul, we got him again. Just like back in chapter 23, verse 19. Of course, now the Ziphites have a little different story going on. First time, they were afraid because the city of Nob was destroyed, the people, and they were terrified by it, and they wanted the reward. Now they have a third motive. If David becomes king, from their point of view, they're in big trouble. They said, now that David escaped, because they thought it was a sure deal that David would be caught and killed, and now David looks like he might defeat Saul, and the men from Ziph go, this is bad news. <laughs> if he becomes king, he might pay us a visit. We really have to get rid of this kid before he gets in the position that it looks like he's going to get into. I mean, after all, Saul has now prophesied, you will be king of Israel, David. Saul has now agreed with Jonathan. If you remember back in chapter 23, 17, Jonathan said, Saul's son, you will be king. So Samuel prophesied it. 
Jonathan prophesied it, Saul has now prophesied it, and Abner in 2 Samuel 3, he says it. He goes, didn't we all know you were the anointed? And that's uh, Saul's five-star general. He goes, all the time we all knew the prophecies that you were the one anointed. Everybody knew it. And the Ziphites are going, hey, this is trouble, man. This guy, he keeps getting out of trouble. We've got to really get him this time. So they sent a delegation up, verse 1, and Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph. Same 3,000 men to seek David. Oh, well, what happened to that weeping, covenant-making, self-disclosing Saul back in chapter 24? He's, he's in a different mood. He wants to kill David again. Saul camped in this particular hill country, and David stayed in the wilderness. And David saw that Saul had come after him. David sent spies out and understood that Saul had come. David would dispatch these spies all around, always searching to any group of, of men that would be uh, coming in this large cluster. That was one of the negatives Saul had, is that he was such a coward, he always went in mass, you know, and, and it was a lot easier to spot these guys when they were coming. Verse 5, David arose and came to the place where Saul was encamped. David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner, the commander. Now Saul lay within the camp, because he'd be in the center of the camp, you know, to protect the king. And they would just kind of make concentric circles all the way out, 3,000 of them, and Saul would be at the very center. <clears throat> David answered and said to Ahimelech, and to Abishai, you guys want to go down with me to the camp? <laughs> and they go, and I, to do what? <laughs> you want to like greet Saul? I mean, go to the camp. And Abishai, he, he's really, a, he's literally, he's a real warrior type. He goes, I'll go for six. I love that. And of course, his profile throughout the whole life of David, he's always, that guy's on the edge. He's, he's looking for a fight all the time. He goes, hey, I'll go. He's Joab's little brother. Him and Joab are always looking for trouble. Verse 7, so David and Abishai, Ahimelech said, no, no, he goes, I, I sense the Lord wants me up here. <laughs> it's interesting, he's just kind of gone now. <laughs> Abishai came <clears throat> to the people by night. Their Saul was laying asleep within the camp and with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and the people lay around him. And Abishai said to David, here's the same old line here. God has delivered your enemy to your hand. Strike him. Better yet, let me strike him. See, you're innocent. You didn't do it. I did it. Hey, comes down good. David says, no, no, no. I'm not trying to create a good story to where I'm technically innocent. No, God is watching. Abishai, God, I don't want to strike him. Why not? Nobody, Abishai, listen. There is a throne that rules the whole earth. And he's watching us right now. I know, David, that's what you said back in chapter 24. Come on, I mean, how long is this going to go on? No, no, Abishai, you don't understand yet. He goes, we don't want to speed the process up. Now, this is serious. He's got a guy willing to take the responsibility before God and the responsibility before men. And David goes, no, I'm not trying to pull it off. It's real. I don't want to speed it up. It's real. I really don't want to be king till God makes me king. For real, I don't. Of course, one of the great chapters that, uh, thing that, that takes place we won't be able to get to in this course is chapter 2 Samuel 2, verse 1. It's just one of the classic, it's, it's the same principle. I'll just quote it to you. It's 2 Samuel 2, verse 1. Saul has now been killed by the Lord, and there's no competition. There's nothing in the path. There's the 12 tribes of Israel. And David says, well, now that all the obstacles are removed, David goes into the prayer closet. 2 Samuel 2, 1, and... His men never liked it when he went to the prayer closet because they said, No, David, don't ask God. Just become king of Israel. Just make it simple. You've all been, you've been prophesied. It's been seven years you've been chased in the wilderness. Just be king. David, just make it simple. David says, No, I'm going to pray first. They all, word gets through the camp. What's, what's going on? He's praying. He's going to ask God for confirmation. He can't just take a gift. David, you need to learn how to receive. What about the other 11 tribes? David said, the Lord said, no, not yet. David, what are you, you're, you're 30 years old. You're anointed of the Lord. Saul's dead. You've been in the wilderness seven years. David says, you guys don't understand. I don't really want to be king. That's not, you guys want me to be king so I can give you some good salaries. I don't want to be king. I want to do the will of God. Because if I'm king out of the will of God, it's going to cause trouble for all of us. 
David says he takes one, one tribe. That drove them nuts. They go, why don't you just do what normal men do? David says, I'm not a normal man. I really have my reward already working in my heart from heaven. I don't, this isn't my reward to be in a place of power on the earth. And for seven years, from age 30 to 37, he reigned in Hebron over one of the 12 tribes. Partial promotion. He would not take 12 tribes until he's 37. And the Lord then gave him the other 11 tribes. And then he had it all the way. But the Lord directed him and protected him and provided for him each step of the way. What a great lesson. David will not take. He, he, he has a good alibi right here. He won't take the position. He goes, no, don't do it for me. Hey, before God, I'll kill him for you. No. Even when the word gets out, they'll all know that you were blameless. No, Abishai, you don't understand. I don't want the position out of the will of God. He couldn't understand that. Verse 9, David said to Abishai, let me go through the lesson that I told you back in the cave of Engedi, back in chapter 24. You don't touch, verse 9, God's authority. You don't touch it without getting in trouble with God. You don't touch divine authority. In a wrong way. Again, I've seen people abuse that doctrine. I've seen people, whether spiritual authority in the church or in other positions of life, and they, they use it in a very... So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, suspicious of how people use that doctrine. I've seen a lot of pastors beat down people with this kind of thing, and it's a very, very inappropriate. Verse 10. David said, furthermore, furthermore, he's like, and I, let me give you another message, Abishai. Not only do I respect the spiritual authority, God will strike him. And his day shall come to die. He'll go out to battle. He goes, there's a day God's appointed. God will take care of him. Abishai, do you understand it? Boy, David, I think he's really going for it here. In verse 11, the Lord forbid that I should touch him. He goes, I won't even touch him like I did last time. But he goes, this is what I will do. I'll take the spear and the jug of water. David took the spear, the jug of water. Look at into verse 12. They were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. What a bizarre incident here. Again, another divine appointment. But it's not so that David can get rid of him. It's so David can be tested. This is so interesting. Now, my question is, how did David know that the spirit of the Lord was going to cause a deep sleep to fall on him. I think somehow he had a, 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 some kind of understanding from the Lord the Lord was going to intervene in this way. I don't think David was reckless. I think Abishai would have said, hey, let's do it, man. Let's go for it. But I think David was operating under the wisdom of God when he went down there. I don't think this was reckless. I think I, there's no way to prove it, but I think he did. David went, verse 13, over the other side of the hill. He called out to the people, Abner, hey, head of the army. Do you not answer, Abner? They're kind of waking up. And Abner said, Who are you anyway calling out to the king like this? You know, and Abner said, David said to Abner, Are you not a man and who is like you in all of Israel? Who has power like you have? You're the main man in the whole nation. Why have you not guarded the king? The king could have been killed. Verse 16, I'm paraphrasing. The thing that you've done is not good. You should be killed because you've fallen asleep on the job. You're not guarding the anointed of the Lord. He says, what are you talking about? Verse 17, Saul paraphrases, Abner, be quiet. That's David. He goes, oh man, he, the Lord is really with him. He did it again to us. In front of 3,000 men. Here we go, round two again. 3,000 men going, hey Saul, why don't you just give in? We like this guy. You know, little by little, we're starting to really believe the Lord's with him. Saul says, Verse 17, it's David. Is that not your voice, my son? David said, it's my voice, O king. Verse 18, why does my Lord pursue his servant? What have I done? He goes, why are you so afraid of me? Verse 19, now therefore, please let my Lord the king hear the words of his servant. The Lord has stirred you up against me. And let the Lord accept an offering. He goes, if I've done wrong, let me repent. Let me give the animal sacrifice and let's get this thing behind us. But if it's the children of men that have stirred you up, if it's the men in your court who are jealous of me, let them be cursed before the Lord, for they've driven me out 
from the presence, from my inheritance in the Lord. And in terms, he's talking about my ability to uh, participate in the tabernacle worship and the, the sacrifice system with the priesthood. He goes, I've been driven out of the presence of the Lord in that, in that legal sense. He goes, these men have lied. He goes, what, why are you letting this happen? So now, verse 20, don't let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea. I'm just a, a partridge in the mountains. You're hunting. I'm a nobody. So here he goes again. Verse 21, sweet rebellion. I've sinned. Return. He says, oh, yeah, I've heard that one before. For I will harm you no more. This is literally the fourth or fifth time Saul said this and Saul meant it. Saul said it and Saul meant it for 72 hours. He says, I've been a fool. I've erred exceedingly. I mean, what repentance, what vulnerability, what confession and omission in front of 3,000 people. But it's not, it doesn't, none of it sticks. David honors the office, but doesn't trust the man. Forgives the man, honors the office, but doesn't trust his integrity. David answers in verse 22. Here's your spear. One of you young men, come over here and get it. He said, you can have his spear back. Verse 23, may the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. There he is again. There he is. It's that prayer again. Let the Lord decide. He goes, let the Lord intervene and repay now. For the Lord delivered you into my hand. This is the second time. He, it's the same point over. It's probably the seventh time he's repeated this phrase. But it's the Lord's anointed. It's the authority of God on you. I won't touch it. I won't touch God's authority. I won't do it. The Lord will take care of you, not me. David says, that's one of my big principles. Verse 24, your life was valued this day in my eyes. So let my life be valued in your eyes. And let the Lord deliver me out of all my tribulation. Saul said to David, may you be blessed, my son. For you shall both do great things and you shall prevail. So he prophesies and blesses him again. You will defeat me and you will do great things for God. The spirit of prophecy comes on Saul again. And David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. It's the last words that Saul said to David. The very, very last words he spoke to him. He blessed him as the anointed of the Lord. He said, you will prevail over me and you'll do great things for God. We know that Saul is still in a bad way because Saul goes to consult a witch before a great battle against the Philistines in chapter 28. And he dies in chapter 31. Saul's right at the end. David doesn't know Saul's at the end. He's about a year and a half away from dying. But he blesses him, and that's the last time they're together. It's interesting, in 1 Samuel 24, it's passive. Saul comes to David. 1 Samuel 26, it's active. David goes to Saul. So the first one is very different. God brings Saul to David, and it's kind of David's going, boy, this is a coincidence. But the other time, David was being active. He wasn't just, it wasn't just something that appeared. David... By the leading of the Lord, knowing that the sleep was going to fall, I'm assuming, David went to Saul. Something prompted David to do that. And so on both, on both situations, God has tested David with the power of revenge. And David doesn't take it, but yet he sees the divine test. He sees the divine appointment. He goes, no, nah, I'm not going there. I know where this is going. I know this is going. And it wasn't just something David did for, as an image. That wasn't just something he did so he could tell the story. David saw God as his source, not, not King Saul. Amen. Let's stand. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.